Welcome to We Got Goals, a podcast by a sweatlife.com on which we talk to high achievers about their goals. With me this week is Parker Brook, who is the founder and CEO of Lovebird Cereal. He founded the company just after leaving Big Food, um, just before the pandemic, and founded the company to be the answer to his own food problems, as well as some autoimmune issues, giving himself something he could eat and some some cereal he could eat. Uh, Parker, welcome to the podcast. Tell us a little bit about Lovebird and why you started it. Yeah, thank you for having me. I'm very excited. Uh, Lovebird was really born out of three things. One, kind of my professional experience in big food and trying to become an agent of change within a big organization to make better food for more people. Uh, when it became apparent that wasn't going to be possible, I kind of grew a little disenchanted with the whole thing and was starting to think about different next steps for me and what I really cared about. Uh, and then it happened that I was on my own personal health journey uh, that started with more food as medicine when I was managing some autoimmune disorders, but then quickly evolved into fitness and all the different elements of well-being. And then when I became a father, uh, two years ago, which is insane that I have a toddler right now, uh, it really put everything into perspective. And I was like, I have to make this leap. And I think through kind of my, my health journey, my food experience and becoming a father, uh, it was just the perfect time to go do this. Uh, I did not anticipate a pandemic on the horizon. So that only added to the challenges, but was able to pull it off and, and launch uh, last November. And things have been going really, really well since. And Lovebird Cereal is available direct to consumer now, right? Yep, it's available on my website. It uh, will be available in some local co-ops soon, uh, but primarily on my website. It's exciting. How big is the team today, Parker? You're looking at it, me and my daughter, Yuki. <laughs> <laughs> what is Yuki's role these days? Uh, she's like the head of like product and inventory. She does a horrible job though. She eats all of the product. She can barely count to a hundred. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so before, <laughs> what was that? The numbers are always off. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's, it's all about talent. Uh, so Parker, why cereal? Why'd you start with cereal? It's always been a favorite food of mine. Uh, I worked a lot of it, worked a lot on it while I was in big food. And then as I was looking at the biggest areas to make a difference, cereal immediately came to the top. It's one of the largest categories in the middle of the store, if not the largest. And it was just a category full of really bad stuff for you. It's a, a lot of refined grain, refined sugars, uh, and the fact that a lot of adults and a lot of children were starting their day with essentially a sugar bomb that would give them a turbocharged peak uh, and then a crash shortly after didn't really sit well with me and I knew there was a better way to make it. Um, and so that's when I set out to go and do something in cereal to start, but the hope is to expand a bunch of, or expand across a, a bunch of different categories as well. I love that. It actually, it reminds me a lot of, of Caitlin Smith, the way you're talking about it now and, and simple mills, how she got started with one simple baking mix, um, and then expanded from there. So you're going from the inside of the grocery store, the heart of the grocery store out. Yeah, I'm, I'm humbled to be mentioned in the same sentence as her. She's she's a she's a rock star, so that's awesome. Simple Mills headquarters are right down right down the street from here, so I'll, we'll give her a wave out the window here. Well, Parker, let's jump in. Tell us about a big goal that you set and accomplished. How you got there, and why it was important to you. Yeah, I mean, I, it's a great question, and I think my big goal was really a series of like smaller goals that rolled up into the big one, but. As I mentioned, my, my health journey started with food, but then became much more about movement and uh, like physical fitness as well. And so I went from not being able to do a lot of stuff and not being in great shape to really kind of piece by piece building myself up. And it culminated with last year, I did five century rides, which are 500 mile bike rides. And so I've really kind of fallen in love with cycling. And I think it's just a, a testament of just kind of endurance, but also insanity to get out there and bike for five or six hours straight. And so that was a big physical goal of mine. And I think through those acts and through fitness, I was really able to 
reframe how I approached rest, the rest of my life. And it gave me the confidence to go and leave my stable, uh, very comfortable big food job to be an entrepreneur, which is very tough and challenging. Uh, and a lot of self-doubt uh, comes along with that. But through fitness, I was able to kind of face things head on and do hard things. And it was just the same process of breaking it down into small pieces and doing those. And then ultimately they add up to some big shiny object you can talk about, but a lot of the hard work goes unseen. And so that for me was kind of a, a big vote of confidence and turning point that I can do anything and I can, you know, jump off the ledge and figure it out. I love that. Um, so talk a little bit about what it was like when you were kind of at your health worst, like what, what were you physically able to do? What did it feel like? Um, what was, what was that experience like? Yeah. I mean, it was, I think a lot of people walk around or are just on this earth, just not at their best self. And for me, it was sort of like, I didn't really realize how it affected me until I started taking things more seriously. And still until I started taking diet seriously, movement every day, seriously. And, you know, where I am today, I'm in the best mental and physical shape of my life. Uh, and it's because of those gradual small changes I made along the way. And so uh, for me, it's, just, it's part of that process, uh, you know, specifically, you know, I couldn't, couldn't go out and run. I'd be very out of breath, uh, just get tired really quickly, be lethargic all the time, you know, come home from work and just like pass out from exhaustion. Uh, it was a very difficult time, but I didn't really know what was going on. And so I immediately thought of food. And then once I combined that with more movement and fitness was really when things kind of took off and, and led to kind of where I'm at physically and also professionally with Lovebird. It's super interesting too, because I, I can only imagine how it must have felt to do that first century ride. Thinking back to what you were able to do kind of before you went on your health journey um, and flashing forward to what you were able to do after you went on your health journey. Can you kind of compare and contrast and, and tell us how, how it feels to be able to do that much? It's amazing. I mean, I think it's a feeling that you can really do anything. Like I think a lot of, you know, my favorite saying is like, how do you eat an elephant? And it's like, you know, piece by piece, right? Like I think people look at these huge goals and they're like, I can never do that. I can never summit that mountain, but you just kind of begin with a single step. And so I think for me, it was like super impactful to kind of overcome that. And, you know, I went from somebody saying like making fun of people in like cycling shorts to being one of those people and like, <laughs> I'll never bike more than 20 miles and I'll never bike more than 50. I'll never bike a century. That's crazy. I'll never do a century unsupported. That's crazy. Like it just, you keep raising the antes. And I think what is possible shifts. And I think at this stage, like really anything's possible. I believe anybody given the right mindset and circumstance can do whatever they want to do. And I'm, I'm interested too, you talked about cleaning up your diet and changing the way you ate. Um, so kind of what went and what came into your diet in that time? Yeah. I mean, I, I would say like, I, I wasn't the eat, eat fast food every day, drink a soda every day, like live off of Coca-Cola or Diet Coke, whatever. In the Midwest, it's most likely probably Mountain Dew. Uh, <laughs> but like in, in high school and college, obviously my diet was terrible, but I started to clean it up piece by piece. But I really never applied a method, like I wasn't very methodical with it. I was like, oh, I'm going to like eat this instead of that. And I wasn't really getting to the root cause. And so I've kind of started experimenting with different diets. It started with the gluten-free diet, which I noticed an immediate difference. And after that, it was a bunch of other different diets uh, from Whole30 uh, and paleo, tried keto. And then I tried the autoimmune protocol, which essentially removes all of the potentially high inflammatory ingredients. So think like a paleo or a Whole30, but you also eliminate nuts and seeds uh, and nightshades, which are like tomatoes and eggplants. Uh, and the goal is just to remove all of that stuff and then slowly add it back to see what your body reacts to. Cause I did a bunch of food sensitivity tests and I really didn't find them to be all that reliable. I think there's a few that are very reliable, but most of them, you know, they're gonna tell you, you have a reaction to eggs when in fact you don't really have a reaction to eggs. So the really the only way to really get to the root cause is to do an elimination diet, strip everything away for 30, 60, sometimes 90 days, and then slowly add it back to see what your body responds to. Because 
everybody's body is very different. Uh, my body is different from your body. It responds differently to different foods or different activities. Uh, and so for me, it was really taking a more personalized approach to like, what does my body specifically respond to? And I think for a lot of people, it, it's gluten, uh, it's dairy for a lot of people and certain types of dairy are okay versus others. And then for me, it was a lot of the industrial seed and vegetable oils, uh, which are like in everything. Uh, and so the grain-free, uh, the no refined sugars, uh, and then the no refined uh, vegetable oils uh, were kind of the key things. And that's what I modeled uh, Lovebird off of to kind of strip those out of packaged food. Because if you look at a lot of packaged food, those ingredients are in everything. So today, what's, what's in Lovebird? Um, and kind of how did that come out of your own journey? Definitely. And so all of those things I removed were immediately rolled into Lovebird. Then it's sort of a question of like, you removed all of the things that were causing either, you know, your gut to bloat or a feelings of uh, being lethargic, uh, you know, mental fog, all of those things. Then it's sort of like, all right, well, what do you add to kind of boost your health, right? You remove the anchors or the drags on your health. What are you gonna add to really boost your health? Uh, and for me, it's really focused on the gut health, uh, which I'm a firm believer in just like if your gut is imbalanced or not healthy, like your mind is not balanced and not healthy and you're going to be more prone to get frustrated, uh, more quick to anger, and you're just not going to be your best self. And so the ingredients that are, are in Lovebird are cassava flour, which is, is rich with prebiotic fiber. Uh, collagen, uh, which I think a lot of people are familiar with now in terms of just overall hair skin health, but also it's been proven for gut health as well. Uh, and then just naturally sweetened uh, with honey and coconut sugar. So unrefined sugar uh, in a small amount to give it a, a little bit of taste. And so it was really focused on just real clean ingredients that you would find in your pantry. And that's why I put them on the front of the box, um, which a lot of other packaged foods would never dare to do because there's a bunch of hard to pronounce uh, science experiments uh, that they use to kind of trick your biology to, to overeat. And so that was really the, the transition from my health journey into an actual food product. Uh, and I took those principles along with me. I love that. Um, also love, love to point to another Chicago company here too. Um, taking a page, which I think RX bar loves, but taking a page from RX bar, just putting it right on the box. I, the front of the box. I love that. Yeah. Except for mine has all of the ingredients on the front. All every ingredient. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That's the I difference. <laughs> I love it. Well, let's, let's talk about a goal you're striving to achieve in the future and how you plan to get there. Yeah. I mean, I, I think that's a great question. And, uh, I've been so head down that I've been just focused on like the next day, the next production run. Uh, but I really think my ultimate goal is to raise $1 million to fight childhood cancer by 2025. Uh, and I will need to grow a lot to do that. But part of the mission of Lovebird is also to give 20% of my profit to fight childhood cancer, which was really born out of uh, me becoming a father. And then I did some genetic testing for my autoimmune diseases at a children's hospital. So picture six foot five Parker in a children's hospital waiting room with a bunch of like six to 10 year olds, uh, you know, sitting in a little chair is pretty comical, but they had a wall there that a lot of the patients wrote down insp inspirational quotes to other patients. So kids writing notes to kids. And uh, I think it was like a seven-year-old girl wrote like, you are stronger than you know, which is actually part of the lovebird poem on the back of the box. Um, and I was just like floored that a little girl battling such a fierce and unforgiving opponent would have that mindset. And I was like, well, like anything I have going in my life is not near as severe as battling cancer as a child. So I was like, as a newly minted father, I was like, that's what I'm gonna be focusing my energy on to make it a better place for kids through diet, but also kids through helping, uh, helping kids that are you know, battling such a unforgiving opponent and doing what little I can. So that's really the, the guiding light of Lovebird is just to give back to that cause. And so that's really my big goal. Uh, it is very big and audacious, so we're got to get to work to make that happen. But I think that's when you're at your best, when you really stretch yourself. 
I love that. And I love the sort of mission and how it ties into you, you becoming a father too. Um, Parker, I know that a million for cancer, that means you have to have 5 million in profit <laughs> um, for your company too. So that's, that's an even bigger profit goal. Um, has, has fighting childhood cancer been a part of the mission since the very, very beginning? For sure it has. Uh, and that's really as I was looking to leave big food and start my own thing, like I've launched a ton of different products that tasted good and did well and had success, but I never felt like any of them made a difference. Uh, Mm -hmm. And I feel like food has such an opportunity to do that. It's sort of this like compounding equation where like you eat something terrible, you may feel bad after it. If you have a sensitivity, it's a different story, but like, it's not something that's going to like hurt you immediately. It's Mm -hmm. sort of those decisions over time affect you. And so I felt like for kids to grow up eating this stuff from the moment they're able to chew things like, you know, around one all the way to 18 before they kind of go off and do their own thing, they're really eating terrible stuff. And I just don't, I was kind of like, how could I help clean up the diet and obviously fight childhood cancer, but like all of that ladders up into like giving every child the opportunity to make the world a better place. And so that was like my purpose. I'm like that, that's what preceded the cereal. That's what preceded the food idea. It was like, how can I help children and how can I leverage what I'm good at, whether it's professionally and personally. Uh, and that's kind of how I wound up with Lovebird. And so it really was a brand uh, and a mission born out of that purpose. And so that's why you see it intertwined in everything I do. I, I mean, I love that. And I also, it's interesting to hear you talk about like your view on food. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I think a lot of, a lot of new CPG brands and just food in general is kind of, it's starting to steer that way. Like the industry at large, maybe is not but new brands are going that way. Do you, are you hopeful about kind of the direction of food? I mean, I was, I was really hopeful uh, prior to the pandemic. Uh, and I actually think it's a fascinating, uh, not an experiment, but just occurrence that prior to the pandemic, like old guard established packaged food brands were like declining. And cereal, I don't think had grown since like 1998. Uh, but as a result of the pandemic, cereal is growing for the first time in like 20 years. And a lot of these big brands that are pretty terrible for you, if you're eating them every day, every once in a while is fine. You got to find out what works for you. But if you're eating them repeatedly, they're not great for you, period. And to see that shift, all of that momentum we had prior to COVID shift back to these nostalgic, bad for you, but great tasting and very affordable products uh, was kind of like a, whoa, like this is we're at a crossroads. Like, I think people are sort of like, we're on the health train and they got stressed out as everybody does. And they went back to things that were comfortable and tasty uh, and just kind of got them back hooked on that. And so I really feel like we're at a pivotal crossroads to kind of make a big difference and kind of have these emerging brands continue to march on uh, and really drive those big companies that make changes. Uh, So it's sort of a pivotal moment right now to really make sure that that momentum isn't lost and we can regain that and continue to see more and more healthy products in the marketplace. Yeah. It's, it's really interesting, especially when it comes to grocery too. Like I know you've, you've launched products and you've gotten them into grocery. Can you talk a little bit about the process of getting into a grocery store and what it takes to see your food on a shelf? Yeah. I mean, it, it is, uh, it depends on what you want to do. If you're thinking like a, a big box, like a Kroger or even a big box, natural organic customer, like Whole Foods, uh, it takes a lot of resources, both financial and just people to make all of that happen. Uh, but it, to simplify it, it's, you have an idea, uh, hopefully, hopefully it's an idea you can execute in a commercial kitchen or in your own kitchen. Let's say you love making nut butters uh, and you have this great nut butter recipe. Uh, you perfect the recipe in your kitchen. I would recommend people go to a farmer's market or even it's pretty easy to launch a website right now on Shopify. It's as easy as making a Facebook page or an Instagram page. Uh, and so you can create a website and just start 
selling it and start reaching out to people and see how they react to it. And I think that's a better way for a lot of small entrepreneurs to start. Because if you go straight into groceries, you, it's sort of like going straight to the, you know, MBA or straight to the NFL. It's you didn't do all the steps before that. So you better be LeBron James if you think you're going to just show up in Whole Foods and do really well. Uh, all of the brands that wind up there have been on a three, four year journey to get there. Um, so I think just start small, start at farmer's markets, uh, friends and family, like really press them to give you good feedback on that. And then look at direct to consumer online and launching your business. I think more and more people are buying groceries over the internet, which is kind of uh, an acceleration from COVID as well. Uh, and then when you're ready and you feel like you got the product dialed in, you got the packaging dialed in, uh, and all of those different attributes, including pricing, then I would kind of look at grocery. But your local co-ops are a great place. They're super flexible and will love to take on local entrepreneurs and are, are more patient. But if you're looking at a bigger grocery uh, store, I would just be a little bit careful. And Parker, I'm a Minnesota native and you live in Minnesota. Um, so when we talk about uh, a co-op that you're getting, are we talking about the wedge? Is that yeah, the Lake Winds and the Wedge, uh, both nice. are interested. And then uh, Irwan Market in LA is also interested. And so uh, I think those are, are perfect fits for Lovebird. Uh, I'm really looking to grow Lovebird the right way. I think in addition to what I was saying about going to big grocery customers, like if you get into Whole Foods, uh, even a natural or organic customer like Whole Foods, uh, it takes a ton of money. And if you're not performing, then you're out. And I think to do that would compromise the integrity that Lovebird has. And I'd have to raise money and not be able to bootstrap and self-fund the business and have to compromise product quality or my mission. And so to keep things independent, I think this is the right path for me so I can kind of execute my vision the way I, the way I see it. Love that. And then last question on this um, tri trial and um, testing. Um, much like what you'd see in a grocery store, like at the end cap, you see a brand there sampling um, has kind of all but died <laughs> during the <laughs> pandemic. So I'm curious, Parker, how are you getting people to try the cereal for the first time? Are you are you hearing from folks who try it and, and buy it online? Yeah, um, I think I really divided into two phases. It was just kind of like launch it and see how people respond to it. I wasn't going to put a ton of marketing behind it. I just wanted honest feedback. And so I didn't want to bias anybody. And I got some pretty positive feedback from folks and a lot of influencers on Instagram that, you know, reached out wanting to try it and I'd send it to them and they would try it, then share it with their followers. And really anybody that reached out to me for product, no matter who they were, I would just send it to them. I mean, if you were interested enough to, to direct message me on Instagram or email me and was more than happy to send it when I was starting off and just get feedback other than, you know, my parents and my two-year-old daughter who thinks everything I do, I do is awesome. Uh, I needed a little bit more of an independent read on that, uh, on a, a more objective read. But uh, yeah, I mean, it was just kind of, it, you're absolutely right in terms of the grocery store sampling is dead. It's starting to come back a little bit in different geographies. Um, but the way it looks will probably forever be changed. But at the end of the day, you're selling food, right? And people have to taste it. And so I think I was lucky enough that a lot of people were bought into the concept of it, uh, the, the purpose and the mission of the company. And they were willing to kind of take that chance on Lovebird uh, as well. And then sort of experimenting with a uh, risk-free trial, you know, love it or your money, love it or your money back guarantee. So more people feel confident in kind of making that initial purchase to try it. Love that. Um, I just bought my, my three pack. So I'm looking forward to getting that. I pre-ordered dear listener. So if you pre-order too, don't get mad that you get it later. Um, soon, and you, soon. Yeah. Three flavors, right? Three flavors. We have honey, cinnamon, and unsweetened. Very excited to try them all. All right. Are you ready for some rapid fire questions? <sighs> I might need a sip of water. Uh, no, let's go. <laughs> I was like, I can take a sip of Spindrift. You can take a sip of water. Uh, okay. Question one, what is your preferred milk of choice to Ooh. eat with your Lovebird cereal? Ooh, I like uh, coconut milk from Thrive Market. Just in the can, just pure. All it is is coconut and water. Love it. What's Yuki's favorite? 
Uh, it used to be anything I put in front of her, and now she loves eating it with yogurt. So she likes the Siggy's uh, non-dairy yogurt uh, and almost exclusively eats that. I try to give her like a tub, and she like knocks it off the counter, which my dog is super excited about. Me, not so much. She sounds like a great time. Yeah, she's a firecracker. I don't know where she gets that from, but she, <laughs> she knows what she wants, and she wants it now. Love it. What's her birthday? Yuki's birthday? Mm-hmm. Uh, March 15th. March 15th. I was like, what is, what's her sign? <laughs> <laughs> so All right. Her sign is more. <laughs> <laughs> her sign is, I love it. Okay, next up. If you uh, had to give advice to any working parent based on launching a product and doing it from home and being a dad all at the same time, what would it be? I would say give yourself grace and patience uh, and realize that you can't do all things and try to structure your day or structure your time in a way to kind of do the things you want to do and prioritize. But just give yourself grace. I think I spent, when I first started, I was really burning the candle at both ends. And like my health was a kind of a consequence of that. I wasn't sleeping. I was not eating the right things. And I kind of fell off a little bit, but I'm in a much better spot now. And so realize that it's kind of a, a marathon, but there are certain moments that, especially when you're raising kids that you just don't get back. I mean, my daughter's like a little over two now and we just welcomed our second child uh, into the world three weeks ago and like just seeing the differences between the two the time moves so fast and we're just trying to really soak up all of the moments with our youngest and also with our two-year-old uh, because they're still young kids but just being present uh, and knowing what's important I think the one trick I use is just like, what would my 80 year old self think of what I'm doing now? And it's like, I'm sure 80 year old Parker would be like, why are you spending all night working, you know, staring at your computer, like go re read a book to your daughter, or go on a walk with your daughter or spend some time with your son or spend some time with your wife. And so just realizing what's important, but at the end of the day, we're all human. We make mistakes. So just give yourself that grace and just be patient. Love it. All right. Breakfast for dinner. Yes or no. Absolutely. <laughs> and last rapid fire question, Parker, tell us uh, one tip that helps you stay sane, productive, or healthy um, during this crazy time in the world. Oh, definitely. Uh, I, I try to do at least 10 minutes of movement every day. So sometimes that's a long bike ride or a long run. Sometimes that's just stretching, but just the the routine and making it a habit. Like I feel bad if I don't do it at this point and it's just been ingrained in what I, in my life. And so I feel a sense of accomplishment. I try to do it in the morning. I'm not the best always with that, but I'll, I'll do it every day, no matter what. I mean, I've stretched uh, like on the floor in the middle of the night in between bottle feedings, like just trying to figure out a way to do it. But like, for me, it's just like having that routine of like one healthy activity that I do every day, I think results in this virtuous cycle and other facets of your life. Yep. What you do in the gym reflects on the rest of your life. And now in the gym means whatever floor is available to you. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> behind me. <laughs> right behind me too, uh, yeah. over this way. Parker, this was delightful. This was another episode of We Got Goals at a sweatlife.com production, which is another thing that's better with friends. Thank you, Parker, for being here. Thank you to Ryan Deffitt for editing, for Ryan Bar Yuga for the video production. And thanks to you, dear listener, for being a part of our community.